Hello everybody, welcome. In the screencast I want to show you why the JetBrains MPS Projectional Editor is so powerful. The editor in MPS is called Projectional because you're not editing text but you are editing the AST, the model behind your code directly. Now it's important to understand that programs are trees. So if you write code on the conceptual level what you are building is a tree, an abstract syntax tree or a model basically a hierarchy of constructs that are nested one within another. In a concrete example here, you see I've got a script called sample. It has a child, which is an if statement, which has two children. One is the condition and another one is the body containing the statements that should execute if the condition is true. And in the body, again, we can see hierarchy. There are three siblings step, repeat and step and then repeat itself has a child called body which contains what should be repeated in two times in our case. So you see this is some sort of tree. When you look at a code in this form the tree hierarchy might not always be obvious but MPS gives you an ability to visualize the AST down in the node inspector where you can see a hierarchy directly as it is stored in memory. So this is the so this is the AST directly. And what you see here is called a projection. So it's a projection of the AST on the screen and it's up to the language designer to design the projection or to provide multiple projections if they wish so. While the traditional approach to write code these days is to write text in some sort of text editor or an IDE and that text is then being parsed into an AST or a model that's always hidden behind the scenes and, and the tool uses the AST to do all the fancy tricks, code analysis, refactorings and, and, and things like that and your code is always persisted as text and then reparsed whenever you reopen the project or the, the, the source code. In MPS we decided to abandon the text form of uh, code completely. So your code is, is always represented as a AST, be it when it's persisted on a disk or when it's being stored in version control system or when it's being edited. It's, it's always in the AST form. And then what you see on the screen is a defined projection of that AST on the screen, which may show the AST in one way or another. It may show all the elements, or it may hide some elements, or it may add some extra information to what you see on the screen. As a quick proof that this is a projection editor, not a free text editor, we can just try typing something, let's say here, on the, on the end of the line and if although I'm trying to type nothing is happening on the screen because there's no behavior defined for typing in this region because there's nothing that fits in there the, the language author didn't give you the option to type something after this do statement here the idea of projectional editing is nothing new it's been around for many years but MPS has put a lot of effort into making projectional editors smooth and polished and the experience very close to text-like editing so you can just start typing the normal way you would in a textual editor and the AST will be transformed on your behalf fluently without any extra effort. For example, when editing a Java class, so here I am at a line that contains an empty statement and if I type integer space a, I get a local variable declaration. So now I may just select this line and visualize in the node explorer so now we see that we've got a local variable declaration statement that's the whole line it contain, contains a local variable declaration that's without the semicolon and it, it has a type int it has a name a and that's it now if I type the equal sign I get an initializer currently it's empty. If I type one, type 1 I get an integer constant in there. So if I visualize now the AST, I see that in the AST now we also have an initializer. The initializer has an integer constant and the value of the integer constant is 1. And if I now type plus 2 and again visualize in the node explorer, now we see the initializer is no longer an integer constant but it's a plus expression. 
a plus expression has left and right child. Both of them are integer constants. The left one is 1, the right one is 2. So you see the AST, the code here, has been transformed as we hit characters in the editor. But we were not editing text that will be stored somewhere and reparsed, but we were, by touching the keyboard, we were invoking actions of the editor, and the editor was changing the AST behind the scenes. That's the principle of projectional editing. So instead of thinking of your code as text, you might think of what you see on the screen as being some sort of area which is divided into invisible cells. Each cell corresponds roughly to an element in the AST. And if you start typing or doing anything on the keyboard, those events are being handled by the nodes in the AST, so the AST gets transformed as a result. Now, there is one important consequence of not having code represented as text. You don't need to parse the text, thus you don't need a parser. And if you don't need to parse text, if you don't need a parser, you have much bigger flexibility in how you design your languages. So, for example, you can, you can create constructs in your language that would not be parsable at all. You could have decision tables in your in your language. Whatever your language is, if it looks like Java or like Ruby or like anything else, you might include non-parsable notations. A decision table, in our case here, is a table that, depending on which column and, and which row evaluates to true, returns the value in that particular cell. And obviously that cell uh, might not con it's not restricted to containing just static constants of a particular type, but it may conta contain expressions or method calls or whatever you decide to. And the, and the whole table can be manipulated just like any other expression in your code. So the, the table here represents an expression, so it could be, st it could be stored in, in, in a variable. So now we have a variable that the value of which is initialized by the decision table and the variable is then being returned from the method. Or we could extract extract the expression into a separate separate method somewhere. So we could manipulate this as a whole thing. You know, it, it becomes it becomes a first class citizen, an element of the host language. In a similar way, you might want to extend a language with mathematical symbols, for example. So you may get dedicated syntax for vectors, matrices, summary, fractions, uh, exponents, and, you know, others. And the editing experience is pretty straightforward. So you might, for example, define a summary which takes an index n starting from zero and go in all the way up to list dot size minus one and we'll take that list the value at that index and we'll sum them up. So now we get a summation which we may store in in a variable storing a summary or we might uh, we might extract it into a method. So now we get a method that takes a list and just sums up all the elements of that list and it's being called here from here from the vector or matrix. Since MPS primarily targets domain specific languages and domain specific languages are frequently being used by domain experts who are not professional programmers, for some languages it may be beneficial to use positional notations like form-like notations for example, uh, while well this domain-specific language gives you several options with what shapes you want to draw in a, you know, on a on a canvas, but instead of giving you free-form text-like experience, where novice programmers would be puzzled by not knowing what values, what parameters need to be specified in which order, you provide very explicit form-like notations where all the required values are simply listed with uh, missing values marked in red so the user immediately can see what values or where values belong. 
and if you provide in instant interpretation of that code in in a, in a in a preview window or somewhere then the user might see the effect of all the changes that she makes in the code since MPS languages do not require a parser you can easily create languages languages that are context sensitive for example if you need to embed lang la one language into another and these two languages have colliding keywords like for example if you've got a rule engine that would use Java as a language in which you implement those rules so then in one piece of code you define a rule and then down there you define a class now the word rule might be a keyword in the for example in the in the rule definition language while it is not a keyword in Java on the other hand break is a keyword in Java but might not be a keyword or might have different meaning in the surrounding rule definition language so grammar becomes context sensitive in one part of that piece of code break is a keyword in the other part it isn't and for rule is the other way around. Now with MPS you don't get this sort of problems because MPS always knows which part of the AST which word corresponds to. There's no parsing needed. It's always a direct pointer in to memory showing which concept corresponds to the element you see on the screen. Also, if you don't need to define a parser, you can easily extend languages. You know, extending parsers is traditionally a very hard thing to do. Now in MPS, without parsers, this becomes much easier. So we could combine several languages defined by possibly different language vendors. So we might take Java as the base language, for example. Uh, we might extend it with uh, capabilities of doing currencies. We might use some sort of parallel for loop that's also not part of Java. So we'll be iterating over all the arguments in parallel. And now inside of that we might use a decision table, which again might have been des designed by some other language vendor. So you get the idea, combining languages without the need to, to combine grammars and create extending parsers as a pretty powerful feature of projectional editing. And now, if you paid attention, I told you that the, the way you edit a language is part of the language definition. When a language designer designs a language, she also defines the way that language will be edited. Now, nothing really prevents a language designer to create multiple ways to edit a language. So if you've got a state machine language, now you can look at your state machine as some textual description of all states, events, and transitions, or you could have them organized into a table and uh, edit the state machine as a table. Or you could just open two editor windows and use different projections in each of the windows. Taking this into the extreme, now here we have a language that has three projections. It's a language that may be used for expressing dependencies between components. So you've got a set of components and then a component might depend on other components. And you may define these either in a textual form where you have components and each component might define its dependencies, the other components it depends on. Or you might use a tabular notation where pluses express dependencies of rows on the columns. Or you might use graphical notations, diagrams, where you've got for each, co each component represented as a box and then having a line between boxes if there is a dependency between those. Well, to summarize, with MPS, by leveraging projectional editing, we eliminated parsing altogether. And by eliminating parsing, you can define languages that are not restricted by the limitations of parsing. So you can combine languages nicely, you can have non-parsable or form-like notations, you can have multiple projections for the same code, including diagrams. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.